Hello, everyone. Today, Xiang Chen and I will give a presentation about the data protection working group in Kubernetes. My name is Xing Yang. I work at VMware in the cloud storage team. I'm a co-chair of Kubernetes Six Storage. I also co-lead the data protection working group with Xiang Chen. Hello, everyone. Uh, this is Xiang Qian. I am a software engineer from the uh, cloud department. I work with Xin Heavily on um, providing uh, data protection working group support. Here is today's agenda. First, we will talk about the history behind this data protection working group, who are involved, why we need data protection in Kubernetes. We will talk about the charter, the data protection definition, what other existing building blocks in Kubernetes and what are still missing and what we are working on in order to fill those gaps. And finally, we'll talk about how to get involved. In Kubernetes, Volume Snapshot was introduced as an alpha feature in 1.12 and was promoted to beta in 1.17 release and it is targeting GA in 1.20. This allows us to backup and restore a volume based on volume snapshots. However, many things are still missing. At KubeCon in San Diego at the end of last year, we discussed about this and decided that we should form a working group to focus on this area. The working group was formally established in January this year, and we have been holding bi-weekly meetings since then. As is shown here, many companies have been supporting this working group. Both backup vendors and storage vendors have been participating in the working group. I will talk about why we need the data protection in Kubernetes. Applications have been around forever. However, the architecture of applications has changed drastically or gradually over time. Uh, with the transition from traditional applications to cloud native applications, the architecture is completely different to its uh, predecessors. So we need a new way to do data production for cloud native applications. When containerization was taking off, it was speculated that container applications would not need data protection because they are stateless. But that has changed. A lot of stateful applications are being run within Kubernetes these days. Kubernetes stateful applications use persistent volumes to save their data. A persistent volume has an independent lifecycle from the pod that is consuming it so that data can be preserved on the underlying storage system even if the pod goes away. However, what if the underlying volume on the storage system gets corrupted for some reason? What if the underlying storage system is struck by a disaster? When that happens, even data stored on the persistent volumes will be gone. To prevent data loss from happening, we need to find a way to protect the data stored in the persistent volumes used by the Kubernetes stateful applications. Although how to provision uh, persistent volumes is well known, it is still a challenge to protect your workloads in Kubernetes. This is a problem that this data protection working group wants to solve. This is uh, our charter. This working group is formed so that we can have a cross-seek collaboration to figure out what are the missing functionalities and work together to design features in order to, to provide support for data protection in Kubernetes. Sponsoring six for this working group are SIG apps and SIG storage. Next, Xiang Chen is going to talk about data protection definition. Thank you, Xin. Next slide, please. Uh, as Shin sta stated before, more and more stateful workload started to move into Kubernetes environment. Uh, we see, we observe the strong desire of protecting the uh, stateful applications in Kubernetes context. The main purpose, of course, for that protection 
is to ensure those stateful applications or stateful workloads can be restored to a previously preserved state at any given point of time, uh, especially in the cases like data corruption or DR, et cetera, et cetera. In Kubernetes context, we mainly target, uh, we mainly discuss or target two types of entities. One is the resource, the API resources, and the other will be the data that uses those um, position volumes. This itself is a very complicated and we're a layered problem. Uh, so far, there are a couple of uh, approaches of doing that. I'll go through this later. Uh, next slide, please, Shane. Uh, part of our charter is to define what are the Kubernetes native constructs to enable backup and recovery for different levels. We are not at the position to provide end-to-end -end solution to protect, protect every single application, but we do want to provide common modules that backup vendors or users can easily use. Uh, those include persistent, level, persistent volume level, uh, the volume snapshot, volume backup, and how to restore from a uh, rehydrated volume from those snapshot backups. At application level, how do you know uh, which resources belong, API resources belongs to a specific application? Uh, how do you consistently quiet and unquiet an application so that an application consistent snapshot can be taken? And finally, the cluster level. Next slide, please. As of today, we observe this backup workflows in Kubernetes context. A user, first of all, starts a backup. So it actually goes for two, ste uh, two state steps. The first step is to collect all the Kubernetes resources and back it up to, into some external repository, backup repository. And the other one is the data backup. And in the data backup piece, there are two models uh, right now we observed. One is so-called application native data that dump. For applications like MySQL, they already have a native support of dumping the snapshot data into a file. And then some ex extra components can pick up those dumps and, and put it in the, in the backup repository. And the other way is that the, we call it controller coordinated. And that way, the application do not have a native data dump mechanism. So, uh, but, but it can quiz itself and it can unquiz itself. So the controller will call in, uh, try, first try to quiz the application and create volume snapshots for all the volumes that the application is used and unquiz the applications the application can start serving again. And after that, volume, can, uh, volume data or snapshot data can be exposed into some external backup. On the reverse side, the restore workflow. Next slide, please. A user starts a restore, um, import the backup into the cluster, and then firstly, restore the Kubernetes restore, uh, resources. Uh, but PVPVCs needs to be handled uh, specially because there are many dependencies. Uh, in the native way, mapped to the previous mentioned native way as well, uh, the application can have uh, native data, can restore from a native da data dump. Uh, in the non-native way, uh, just rehydrate PVCs from volume snapshot and volume back. So we have these workflows. What are the, what are the building blocks to support these workflows is what we want to answer in this working group. Next slide, please, Jim. So what are there at this moment, existing back? In the application, from the application's perspective, we have workload APIs, stack for sets, deployment, et cetera, and application CRD. And those are high level constructs that groups a set of Kubernetes resources together to form your application. The other, in the storage layer, we have volume snapshots, which is built on top of PVC, uh, can take a, 
a point in time snapshot of, of volume. So how does this building blocks fit into the picture? Next slide, please. Next slide, please. Yeah, thanks. Uh, the workload API and the Stick Apps application CRD can fit into the Kubernetes resource backup process. With that, it provides a convenient way to group Kubernetes resources in together. Uh, next slide, please. Let's take a look at in how exactly it look like for the application CRD. The application CRD is nothing but providing an API for managing applications in Kubernetes. It aggregates individual Kubernetes components. For example, in this example, it's an application CRD for MongoDB. Uh, it contains a service, a, a stateful set, and maybe some secrets underneath for the YAML file. The key is that with this single CR, you can tell which resources belongs to this MongoDB in the Kubernetes world. Now let's take a look at how one snapshot fits in the picture. So next slide, please, Shin. In, one, in the backup workflow, one snapshot can be used in the controller coordinated workflow, where one snapshot will be created after the application is quiet. Next slide, please. In the restore workflow, worm snapshot can be used to rehydrate PVC from them and restore the workload into the previous state. Uh, worm snapshot has been moving to beta since 119. Next slide, please. And we plan to move the feature to GA in 120. Uh, Validation webhook has been added in version 119, and uh, we are right now working on enhance the observability around the controllers and adding more end-to-end -end tests, mostly stress tests. So um, looking forward to the GA of this feature. So uh, we're talking about existing. So what are missing there? Next slide, please. We're missing a whole lot, and this is not yet a uh, complete list yet. Volume backup, repository, quiz and quiz hooks, et cetera, et cetera. If you take a full picture of this, next slide, please. Uh, all these green boxes are currently existing. The yellow box is working, group, uh, working in progress, and the orange boxes are not there yet. So they've, those components, application backup, can be used to group the resources and data, a coordinated data backup as well. A container notify fits in multiple scenarios uh, in this backup workflow. Next slide, please. In the restore workflow, it is similar. So uh, I will not spend too much time on this. I will let Shin to go through all these orange and yellow boxes in the next couple of slides. Thanks, Xin. It's all yours. Thanks, Xiao Chen. I'm going to explain in more details on why we think all of this are missing building blocks and what we are planning to do with them. The first missing building block we identified is volume backup. We need this because we need to extract data to a secondary storage. We've already got a volume snapshot API, but there's no explicit definition made in the design to have snapshots stored on a different backup device, separate from the primary storage. For some pro cloud providers, a snapshot is actually a backup that is uploaded to an object store in the cloud. However, for most other storage vendors, a snapshot is locally stored alongside the volume on the primary storage. Therefore, it is impossible to design a portable data protection policy to support all storage vendors. Without a volume backup API, the alternative is for backup vendors to have two solutions. For storage systems that upload snapshots to object store automatically, a snapshot is a backup. For storage systems that only take local snapshots, use volume snapshot API to take the snapshot and then have a data mover to upload snapshot to a backup device. We just started discussions about this in the working group. Let's take a look of this diagram. Voting backup is next to voting snapshot here. We put it in an orange box to indicate that 
it is a missing Kubernetes component. We have started discussions about it, but there's no concrete design yet. The next one is CBT and the changed file list. Without CBT and changed file list, backup vendors have to do full backups all the time. This is not space efficient, takes longer to complete and needs more bandwidth. Another use case is snapshot-based replication where you take snapshots periodically and replicate to another site for disaster recovery purpose. So what are the alternatives? Without CBT, we can either do full backups or call each storage API individually to retrieve CBT, which is highly inefficient. We just started a discussion about this in the working group. The next one that we think are a missing building block is the backup repository. Backup repository is a location or repo to store data. This can be an object store in the cloud, an on-prem storage location, or some NFS-based solutions. There are two types of data to be backed up that we need at store, restore time. The first one is Kubernetes cluster metadata. The second one is local snapshot data. We need to back them up and store them in a backup repository. Currently, there is a proposal for object store backup repository. That is the proposal for object bucket provisioning or COSI. This proposes object storage Kubernetes APIs to support orchestration of object store operations for Kubernetes workloads. Therefore, bring in object storage as the first class citizen in Kubernetes, just like file and block storage. It also introduces container object storage interface or COSI as a set of gRPC interfaces for provisioning object stores. Kubernetes COSI is already a sub project in SIG storage. CAP was merged as provisional in 1.20, and the plan is to do prototyping. We already have GitHub repos created for this. There's also a session about Cozy at KubeCon. Check it out if you are interested. So let's see uh, where Cozy is in this diagram. Cozy is in a yellow box indicating that this is a work in progress Kubernetes component. This is an object store backup repository. It can be used to export backup and store the data. Now let's take a look of the restore. Cozy is used to import backup data at the restore time. The next one is generic data populator. Currently, we can only create a PVC for another PVC or a volume snapshot. But what if the backed up data is stored in a backup repository such as an object store? The generic data populator feature allows us to provision a PVC from an external data source, such as a backup repository. In addition, it allows us to dynamically provision a PVC, having data populated from that backup repository and honor the wait for first consumer volume binding mode during restore to ensure that volume is placed at the right node where the pod is scheduled. There is an any volume data source alpha feature gate, which was introduced in 1.18. In 1.20, the plan is to do the design and prototyping for generic data populator implementation. Now let's take a look at the diagram. We can see that generic data populator is needed at the restore time. Generic data populator is in the yellow box indicating it is a work in progress Kubernetes component. It is used to rehydrate PVC from a backup repository during restore. Next one is uh, quiet and unquiet hooks. We need these hooks to quiet application before taking a snapshot and unquiet afterwards to ensure application consistency. We investigated how quiet and unquiet works in different types of workloads. We looked at relational databases such as MySQL that provides a command to flush tables with read lock, so we can use that to do quiet. We looked at time series databases such as NeoDB, 
Prometheus InfluxDB, which do not have a explicit quiz command, but there is a CLI that supports consistent backups and restores. Key value store, uh, we also take a look at the example um, etcd that provides a command to backup and restore, but it, did, it does not have an explicit quiz command. We also look at message queues such as um, Kafka. For example, um, Kafka is designed for uh, fault tolerance. We can do backup and restore in Kubernetes with best effort, but there are many issues. Um, partitioning, maybe rebal rebalancing in Kafka while broker is offline, and that might cause data loss. We also look at distributed databases such as MongoDB that provides a command to flush all pending write operations to disk and locks MongoDB instance against writes. So we can use that command to do quiz, but we need to keep in mind that the process to back up non-sharded versus sharded MongoDB databases are different. We don't have time to go over all the findings here, but we will include them in the white paper that we are working on. We want to design a generic mechanism to run commands in containers, but we want to mention that application-specific semantics is out of scope. We currently have a proposal called Container Notifier. Cap is submitted and it has been reviewed. Let's take a look at the diagram here. Container Notifier is mainly used at backup time to do quiz before taking the snapshot and on quiz afterwards. And this, this is also a working progress Kubernetes component. Uh, the next one is consistent group snapshot. So we talked about the container notify proposal, which tries to ensure application consistency. What if we can't quiz the application or if the application quiz is too expensive, so you want to do it less frequently, but still want to be able to do a, a crash consistent snapshot more frequently. Also an application may require the snapshots from multiple volumes to be taken at the same point in time. So that's when consistent group snapshot comes into the picture. There is a cap on volume group and group snapshot. It proposes to introduce a new volume group CRD that groups multiple volumes together and a new group snapshot CRD that supports taking a snapshot of all volumes in the group to ensure right order consistency. The cap is being reviewed. Let's take a look at the diagram here. Uh, we don't have container notifier to do quiz here, but we have a consistent group snapshot that facilitates the creation of a snapshot of multiple volumes in the same group to ensure right order consistency. The next one is application snapshot and backup. We have snapshot APIs for individual volumes, but what about protecting a stateful application? And there is a cap submitted that proposes a Kubernetes API that defines the notion of stateful applications and defines how to run operations on those stateful applications, such as snapshot backup and restore. This is still at a very early design stage. Uh, as shown in this diagram for backup. Application backup handles the backup of a stateful application. It can leverage a container notifier to do quiz and use Cozy as a backup repository. And uh, similarly, uh, we can have an application restore that handles the restore of a stateful application. So these are all the missing building blocks that we have identified and are working on. We hope eventually we can turn all of this yellow and orange boxes into green ones. And when that happens someday in the future, our mission is accomplished. All right, next I'm going to talk about how to get involved. As discussed in previous slides, this working group is working on identifying missing functionalities in supporting data protection in Kubernetes. 
and trying to figure out how to fill those gaps. We have bi-weekly meetings on Wednesdays at 9 a.m. Pacific time. If you are interested in joining the discussions, you are welcome to join our meetings. We also have a mailing list and a Slack channel as shown here. This is the end of the presentation. Thank you all for attending the session. If you have any questions, please don't hesitate to reach out to us. Thank you.